So if you are visiting in the church today and would like that to be sent to you, just touch the person to the left or to your right. They can just forward that email to you and it can be a little bit easier to follow along. If not, um, and you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can please open your, your Bibles with me to Joshua chapter 7. Um, I was inspired to learn, or excuse me, to preach this lesson because over the last couple of days, the congregation and, and myself, we've been going through this Joshua push. Pretty much what it is, is kind of like Joshua in, in the previous lesson. We talked about Joshua and the Israelites <coughs> conquering the city of Jericho. Yeah. And pretty much how they did that, for six days they walked around Jericho, and on the seventh day, they walked around it seven times before the walls of Jericho fell outwards. And they were able to come and, and walk over the wall and conquer the city. And so kind of in the same fashion, we want to do that here as well. Conquering Auckland for God. Yeah. And uh, so we've been going out, sharing our faith with at least seven people each. And uh, going out and kind of praying around the city, walking around the city. And just praying that we can have victory just how God has given Joshua the victory. Yeah. But as well as we've been reading three chapters of Joshua a day. And uh, yesterday was our chapter seven. Uh, Joshua chapter 7. And I really, really just love this chapter. And so I, I got inspired to preach this because I believe it has a very strong message. See, what I love about the Bible, last week we talked about how, yes, there was a victory in Jericho. But I love the Bible because it doesn't only record the great things that the heroes of faith have done. It also records their faults and the bad things they've done and, and the mistakes they've made. Unlike Islam, which actually kind of claims that each one of their patriarchs is, is faultless, that they're perfect, the Bible actually shows their true faults. Mm. And it's something that we can learn from. See, the Bible is written very differently than what we expect it to be. Mm. Or they teach us things that are revolutionary to us. And I believe there's a lot of things in this chapter are quite different than what we expect life to be. Yeah. See, today's lesson is going to be this upward call of us being called to be holy as our God is holy. Yeah, to free, uh, excuse me, flee from sin as though our lives depend on it. Mm -hmm. My lesson for this morning is Joshua chapter 7, the story of one sin. Mm -hmm. So kind of getting a running start just for those who may have not been with us in the last couple of days or understand the book of Joshua. Think of it as God's people, the Israelites, were now entering in what they call the promised land. And this is something that generations ago, that God has promised that he was going to take them to this new land, out of slavery, out of Egypt, and that can, they can now grow in their heritage. And so they have just got there now. They just destroyed this impenetrable fortress in Jericho. And now this is just right off the back of this great victory. We're going to see what this, 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 this turn starts to happen here in Israel. Mm -hmm. Starting in verse 1, we can already see that things are going wrong. Yeah. It says... But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, in the, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men to Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Haven, near Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spy out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary, weary the whole army. Only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. You know, you, you read right in the beginning, something already went wrong. Yeah. That the, the Israelites were already, verse 1, chapter 7, already unfaithful to God. In the previous chapters, it described those that were the surrounding nations that Israel was going to conquer, that they were, were, were melting in fear. Their hearts were melting in fear. By this, now we start to see the Israelites were now melting in fear. So this is right off the bat of them completely destroying Jericho. The impenetrable fortress that didn't even last one night. But why? What, what was different? What happened? Because one sin can make the difference between life and death. That, that, was, that was the difference. Israel was ready to battle. They were out there. They were excited. They just had this victory. 
They compared their, their past victories to now their current enemy. Like, hey, well, we destroyed Jericho. And it's going to be nothing. You don't need to send that many people. Mm. But they didn't realize that they were in different circumstances this time. Mm. They sinned. Yes, Achan, the one person, was the perpetrator. Right. But yet, this was a command to all of Israel. Yeah. What it's talking about the devoted things is when they would go and conquer Jericho, and God promised it, he said, hey, all the devoted, all the nice, precious, the stones, the, the gold, the silver, you devote that to God's treasure. You give that to God. And yet Achan now here, he, he stole some things for himself. Mm. And Achan, that one person, that one sin, now resulted in many deaths. Wow. And yes, you can make the excuse, well, it was Achan. Why do, why do we have to feel the consequences? Remember, God always saw his people as a body. Mm. It's kind of like if I went up and punched somebody in the face, I can't say, well, my hand threw the, threw the punch. Officer, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know what he was doing. No, no, no. We're, we're all responsible for the body. Come on, Sean. See, we learned something here that's quite new and revolutionary to us. That victory does not come by the powerful, but by the purified. Mm, come on. See, the Bible has always been teaching us that that victory is not in your hands, it's in God's hands. Yeah, right. And we start to see this now. That they were withheld victory because God was withholding it from them. See, they, they convinced Joshua, hey, not the whole army needs to go, right? Before, remember when they were marching around Jericho? The whole entire army had to march, yeah, yeah. even though it was pointless. They were all there together, and now they're already starting to split apart. Oh, my God. After a day. See, sin has this, this deceitfulness to it. It can easily deceive us, making us think that we can do the same thing while we're in sin mm -hmm. when we were righteous. I can do the same thing. Have you ever done that where maybe similarly where you haven't worked out in a long time and you're kind of doing the same thing that you used to do? And you're like, yeah, what, what's, I've done this before. Two years ago, I was running out and everything. I remember uh, the beginning of last year, I guess I say that now, 2019. Uh, Tegan and I, we, we got a gym membership up in uh, U of A, the university there. And uh, there's these classes, like these fit classes that you go in and you kind of do a lot of reputations and everything. And the first class I go to, I'm like, I haven't worked out in a long time, but I got this. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I actually, to be honest, I see like a lot of women there and everything. And I'm like, if they can do it, I can do it. Uh -huh. You know? Because they had like, they, they had weight and everything. And I was like, okay, I can, I, let me at least triple the weight then. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I do it, and I'm not going to lie, within about like 10 minutes of the class, I'm like on the ground, just laying down. <laughs> you know, all the women just looking over me, you know. Just, I, I, got, I got really humbled there. But in the same way, our spiritual fitness, sometimes we think, yeah, I, 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 can, be, I can be righteous. I can, I can do the same thing. Yeah, I'm, I, I messed up yesterday. Yeah, I sinned. But me and God, we're still okay. You don't realize you're living in different circumstances now. It's not the same anymore. You, you, your, your spiritual fitness is not what it used to be. And the sad thing about this, as you read this story, is that Achan was not the one who died. Our sin affects everything and everyone around us. Come on, Sean. It wasn't like Achan. Achan might have actually even went and fought in the battle with the 3,000. But yet God spared his life and said, I'm, I'm going to show you what your sin does to me. Yeah. Wow. Instead, 36 other people died. Wow. Achan possibly had no clue that he was the one to blame for the death of his comrades. Mm -hmm. I wondered if he mourned for them. I wondered later on that night, if he asked God, God, why did you let them die? This battle, we could have easily won, Father. Why did you uh, allow us to have defeat? Have you ever asked a question like that? Yeah. Were you asking God, why is he doing what he's doing while you remain in sin? God, why is my life not going well? God, why aren't you answering my prayers? God, why, why aren't the promises you made me going around? Yeah. All the while that we're remaining in See, people can do the same thing and, 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 and do the same thing when they they like, well, why is God far from me when they're not really seeking God with all their heart? Yeah. And I'm not saying just people. That's, that's myself, right, too. That's my own heart. Is that even us, now we can kind of read this story and we're like, guys, what happened to Achan here? Man, they just had a great victory. We can even ask ourselves in our own heart reading this story and be like, Achan, why did you do this? Wasn't he like all of Israel just circumcised and just did the Passover? Mm. They just had a great...
great celebration after a great victory. Didn't, did he take the, the words lightly of Joshua when he said, but keep away from the devoted things, that you will not be, bring destruction, um, excuse me, bring your own destruction by taking other, uh, any of them? Otherwise, the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it? Wow. We can ask these questions. Why did Achan do this? But then we ask ourselves, okay, when's the last time you've done something wrong when you knew you not ought to do it? Yeah. Right? I know I, I've, I've done that many times in my life. Where while I'm walking there to do it, I'm like, what am I doing? You know, I, uh, I remember there was this one time, me and one of our friends, we decided to break into one of our neighbor's house and steal their dog. And I remember getting into the, the opening up the window and almost getting in. I was like, what am I doing? I'm just joking. No, I have uh, I wanted to see, because I always talk about my crazy childhood. I want to see what you guys would believe. Uh, but I do remember we did break into his car and steal his games. Uh, so a different sin, but not as atrocious as stealing a dog. Um, but in the same way, right? We have things where we're like, why am I doing this? Yeah. Aiken must have said the same thing. Mm. He must have convinced his heart, well, well, it's, it's just a little bit. He's not going to bring destruction on all of Israel just for this bit, right? So he says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 5, it says, it is actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you. And of that kind, not even pe uh, pagans do not tolerate. And man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. As one who is uh, present in with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus on the one who had been doing this. So when you uh, so when you are assembled, and I am with you in spirit, and in the power of the Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. See, this was not just an uh, Old Testament issue in, in the days of Israel thousands of years ago. Even in the new church that Jesus established, he's saying, well, why, why, why do you allow little sin to come into the church? Yeah. Isn't it better to hand someone over to Satan to save them from hell? Hand them over to their sin so they can really see what's going on in their lives so that they can change and now come back. That's what he's saying. Hand them over to Satan to save them from hell. Come on, Sean. See, all the while, people, people are really scared to live this scripture out. All the while, we live in a time where churches are, they, they, they fear calling out sin. They fear that they'll just leave the church. Right. The, the members have already left God if they're continuing to sin. Yeah. They, they're just afraid, well, I'm scared of my attendance. Mm. It doesn't matter about that. Doesn't matter. If, if, if people attend a church, but their hearts aren't with God, God's not here anyways. This is not a church. Right. Come on, John. So we have to call for purity. Yeah. See, one of my favorite songs, songwriters uh, throughout the years, is uh, Muffet and Sons, if you guys have ever heard yeah. that. Muffet and Sons. What, what an amazing uh, group. But one of the lyrics I love from one of their songs, uh, I Gave You All, it, it deeply resonated with me. I, I love this lyric. It says, if only I had an enemy bigger than my apathy, I could have won. Wow. Okay. If only I had an enemy bigger than my apathy, I could have won. Meaning, his enemy wasn't big enough for him to care that much about. Wow. So he didn't put that much effort into it. And so he ended up losing that battle. Mm. I was like, wow, wow isn't, isn't that so true? I believe most people don't fail because the struggle's too hard. I believe most fail because they underestimate the damage one sin can do. That they don't actually take seriously the sin in their lives. Come on, Sean. See, we see how it's already affected Israel, this one sin of Achan. We're going to see how that also affects Joshua, their, their, curi uh, their uh, courageous and strong general. Back in Joshua chapter 7, verse 6 through 9, it said, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, At last, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring these people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us? If only we had been content 
to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your great name? We see here now that Joshua, the guy who was called multiple times throughout the chapters, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. It's, it's all just melted from his heart at this point. Mm. We see here a defeat is more harmful than a victory is encouraging. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Sean. A defeat in your life is more harmful than a victory is encouraging. Yeah. That's something we have to accept that as life. Because a defeat can make you question things. Was it worth it? Right. Am I doing what's right? Does God exist? Does He love me? One defeat makes you question everything. One defeat caused so much fear in Joshua's heart that he lost all strength and courage. In. He forgot the command of God, but only be strong and courageous. And he says this, he says, he continues to say, hey, God, what can I do? What can I say to make it better? What can you do, God? What do you have to do to protect your name? It's unbelievable how all this blame gets put on God's shoulder. You know? What magic words can I say that will make you do it all right? God, what are you going to do to make it better? See, remember Joshua. Um, jo uh, excuse me. Joshua would have been remembering how from one sin, Moses wasn't able to enter the promised land. Yeah. So Joshua's probably getting super desperate here. But now he's putting the blame on God. But, he's, but this is going to be God's response here in Joshua 7, verse 10 through 13. Here's Joshua down on his knees in fear. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Mm. Israel has sinned. They have violated my, uh, violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen, they have lied, they have put them with their own possessions. This is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever is among you is devoted to destruction. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourself in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemy until you remove them. See, God comes back to Joshua and he says, Hey, remember the same warning I gave you to warn Israel? Have you forgotten it? Joshua, there is sin. You don't need prayer. You need repentance. Come on, Sean. Total difference. Yeah. In Proverbs 28, 9, it says, If anyone turns a deaf ear to my instructions, even their prayers are detestable. Dang. Yeah. Wow. See, God tells Joshua to find out what the sin is and to go consecrate them. Yeah. To make them holy. That's all that, that really means. And so many people, that they don't understand that. They're like, God, why is it going wrong? I prayed the prayer. I said, I'm sorry. God's like, you don't need prayer. You need repentance in your life. Wow. You need to change. Come on, Sean. Most people will say, well, how? hey, you don't consecrate people. Make them holy again. I don't want to pass judgment on someone. You know, I, I, I don't want to go out there and talk to somebody about their sin. But God, God's telling us that's exactly what we need to do. Yeah. Instead, God calls us. To be concerned about the purity of the church. Mm. Of not those just those in the church, but everyone around us. There's this call from here, from God, that we have to care more about people's holiness than their happiness. Come on, Sean. Yeah. See, a lot of people, they just want to make people happy, make a smile on everything. But not realizing that they have things deeper in their heart that, that, that separates them from God, that, that in, at the end of the day doesn't make them happy. Yeah. So God's saying, hey, get deep into people. Make them holy, and therefore they will be happy. Mm -hmm. He says, go find out the sin among you, and make the sinner holy again. Most churches will let their congregation sin and respond just with grace, while the outside of the church is actually speaking the truth, talking about that, hey, churches are all just hypocrites. In one way or another, they're kind of true. Right? We do sin. We do mess up. Yeah. They're acknowledging it. The, the church won't acknowledge it. And that's all that God is saying is just acknowledge the truth. You guys have sinned, now go consecrate yourself. That's the main difference. 
See, we see here and already start to see the seriousness of just one sin. One sin can keep us from the power of God. Some will try and reason, you know, well, just one sin, can, can that really, really, really hurt my relationship with God? It's like, well, you know, I lied one time, it doesn't make me a liar. I stole, it doesn't make me a thief. Well, you, you have to understand it in other regards, right? Think of it, well, I raped somebody, it doesn't make me a rapist. Uh, yes, it does. Yeah. doesn't matter if you did it once or twice. That's, that's who you are. Mm. It's the same thing. We have to acknowledge and see the seriousness of our sin. Mm. See, my first challenge here before us is take sin as serious as God. Come on, wow. One Come sin on, is one sin too many. Yeah. Once you do that, you'll start turning tables in your heart. Mm. You'll stop making excuses. You'll stop thinking, oh, I can just get away with it from grace. Yes, God is going to give us grace. There's, there's no getting before God in his throne without grace. Right. But start taking sin seriously. Yeah. Point number two, Achan's hidden sin, Israel's responsibility. Yeah. See, in a way, Joshua was kind of trying to claim ignorance. That, hey, well, why did we lose this battle on Ai? I don't understand. God, what, what, what happened wrong? Even though he just preached before all the devoted things, if you, if you take some, it's going to make Israel liable to destruction. He knows why. Yeah. But God simply reminds them that he was not to blame, but they were. And that we must find a sin, and once found, don't just ignore it. He continues here in verse 14 through 18, Joshua 7. Come on, Sean. In the morning, present yourself tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. And the family the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. Whoever is caught with the devoted things should be destroyed by fire, along with all the things that belong to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. The next morning Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes that Judah was chosen. Then the clans of Judah came forward, and the Zerites were chosen. He had the clans of Zerites come forward by family, and uh, Zimri was chosen. Joshua had the family come forward man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, was chosen. So God says, okay, we've got to find out who's the one who sinned. Get them by first the, the tribes, the clans, the family, man by man. And Looking on the outside of this, throughout this whole process, Achan knew he sinned. And throughout it, he was possibly hoping that God wouldn't find out it was him. <laughs> Even though, you, right, it, it would start at the beginning. Joshua goes up there and says, hey, someone has sinned. Achan knows his sin. And he's like, maybe hopefully someone else sinned and it's not my fault, it's someone else. But then it gets out all the tribes, and it's his tribe. And he's like, Phew. hopefully it still falls on someone else. Someone else can take up this responsibility. He just talked about they're going to be destroyed in fire. He's like, so hopefully someone else gets my consequences. It, it gets now to his, his clan. Hopefully someone else. It gets to his family. He's still not owning up to his sin. It gets up to man by man in his family. He's hoping still his brother or his cousin or somebody else is going to take up his consequences. How crazy is that? He was just so scared about owning up uh, to, to his sin. See, and I think this is, this is not far from our hearts too, right? Most of us will do anything and everything we can to get us to stop from owning up to our mistakes. To just saying, hey, I'm the one who did it. I messed up, I'm sorry. To actually just humbling ourselves. I know that was probably the hardest thing that I had to do, actually becoming a Christian, to actually confess my sin. There are so many things in my life that I just had shame about. Mm -hmm. I, didn't want, I didn't want anybody knowing, even if they were a stranger, I didn't care. But I remember the first time I was starting to become a Christian, and I actually started to confess my sin to people, things that I've never told anybody. There was just this, this burden lifted off my heart. And I thought that they are going to look at me like in just wickedness and disgust, and they're like, and my God's going to forgive me. There, there, there's this, this grace that I knew nothing about. But here we can just see that transparency to not keep our sin hidden is for everyone. 
It's not just for the ch church members. It's not just for the pastors. It's for every single person to get open in their lives. See, Achan was afraid of owning up to his sin. We continue on and see what Achan says. Joshua then says to Achan, My son, give glory to God, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell him what you have done and do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from uh, Babylon, uh, Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing about 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent and with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent servants and they ran uh, to the tent and there it was hidden, hidden in the tent with the silver underneath. Then they took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites had spread them before the Lord. You know, again, we can kind of get here before Achan and read this like, Achan, what are you doing, man? Why did you take it? And yet we can always kind of forget what we do. You know, we have, we have that sister or like a woman in our life like, man, what are you doing? You know, they come home with like a skirt. I just had to buy it. I saw it. <laughs> you know, even with men, you know, you come home like, ah, I just had to buy this pizza. You know, we don't have any money for it. Achan, Achan could have the same thing on his heart. And, but we see here that he's still going to have to face the consequences of his sin. The excuse that I couldn't help it isn't good enough. Yeah. Wow. I couldn't help it. It's, it's, it's not good enough. I know Jesus came down here to forgive us of our sins, but most of the world takes it as though it excuses us from our sin. There's a big difference. Jesus came down here to forgive us, not to excuse us. Right. He still had to make a sacrifice for our sin. On, Remember, he died for your sin. There's still consequences yes. for it. Joshua calls Achan here before he starts confessing. He says, Achan, give glory to God. Hidden sin in our life gives no glory to God. Right. Right. Come on, Sean. Confession also does not mean when you're back into a corner. Right. Achan didn't confess here. He, he, he was just found out. The stuff in his tent was going to be found anyways. It would have been different if, when they were by tribe, he said, I get it. There's a total difference. My second challenge, guys, is to start a new year. You're never going to accomplish your new year resolutions if you don't rid yourself of old reservations. If you think 2019 is done, it's buried, it's gone just because we can now write 2020 instead of 2019, who here is still messed up writing 2019? Oh, right? Old years die hard, you know what I mean? Um, it's just, it's going to be the same thing with our sin. It's not just going to be done. Things, things aren't just going to be over with. I really want to encourage you guys, if, if you are visiting the church, to get with somebody inside the church and just have a, a deep conversation with them. Talk to them about where you're at before God. Yeah. What are some things that you've done in 2019 you don't want to bring to 2020? What are some sins that you just need to get out of your heart? You're not going to be able to get to the greatness if you don't first rid yourself of this bill. Point number three, and coming up to a close. Achan's confessed sin, Israel's consecration. Come on, See, most people, they just want to confess. Okay, I confess, and I'm just going to go about my way now. I confess, I get it off my heart, it's done, it's over. But we see here, it doesn't always work out that way. Moses, because he didn't trust God at, at the rock, he and all of Israel would not be able to enter the promised land. King Saul, his kingship was taken away from him, even after he realized his fault before uh, not killing King Aga, uh, Agag alive, leaving him alive. David, after he comes to, turn, uh, uh, to terms with his hideous sin of committing adultery, his firstborn still dies. Even though each one of these confess and realize their sin, there's still consequences to it. And the thing is, we have to make right our sin, no matter what. Israel had to do the same thing, continuing here in verse 24. Then Joshua, together with Israel, took Achan, son of Zerai, the silver, the robe, the, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had this, to the village of Achar. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. They had stoned the rest. They burned them. After Achan had heaped up, uh, heaped up a large pile of rocks 
which remain to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, the place has now been called the Valley of Achar ever since. We read here that even though he confessed, he still and all of Israel had to make their sin right. Now, something that even people, scholars and people can kind of not uh, kind of read over and, and, and think is, is quite difficult to accept is, why did they have to kill the kids? Well, there are a couple things that we have to kind of understand when reading this in context. And sometimes people can uh, presume things that aren't actually there. First of all, it cannot be presumed that the kids were like uh, still infants, mm. that they're still children. They were his children, but no longer child. Right, does that make sense? They, they were now adults. We have a hint into their possible age. There's nothing that gives it clearly. But by knowing their genealogy throughout this, uh, there has been four different generations after Judah, meaning that their generations that their kids would have had kids, right? And that they would have been actually older at this point in time. The second, that if Israel had killed Achan's children, and it wasn't their sin, they would actually be violating a, a command in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 14, 16, and throughout the Old Testament, it says, A father shall not be put to death for the children, nor shall the children be put to death for the father. Every man should be put to death for their own sin. We cannot presume that Achan's family held a responsibility just because of Achan's sin. No, that would be violating a whole other commandment of God. No, the thing that we have to understand is, more than likely, they would have known what his father has done. They would have known that he has taken these things into their tent, and they've stayed quiet. There's another command that God says, hey, now you are responsible. In Leviticus 5.1, it says, if anyone sins because they do not speak up when they hear a public charge to testify regarding something they have seen or learned, they will be held responsible. So this is why they have now taken up that responsibility. That they would have been an adult age where they would have held that responsibility of sin. And they must have known that Achan has held this sin. And then during the trial, they still didn't say, it was my father. Mm -hmm. They're still too scared to call out this sin. So we see here that God was bringing judgment on them all and showed Israel that sin would not be tolerated. So many lives would have been saved with the understanding that with each sin, they were not just risking their own lives, but the ones that they loved. Right? So many people, if they just understood that you sinning is not just for you, it affects everyone around you. It's also in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 4.16, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. So, to watch our life and doctrine closely. To follow the Bible. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Man, that's hard. That's difficult to do everything the Bible says. But why do we do difficult things? Because there's great rewards. Yeah. Right? We don't do just difficult things for the sake of it. There's a great reward here promised to do this quote-unquote difficult thing. It says you're going to save yourself and your hearers. You're not just doing it just for yourself, but your family, your friends, your loved ones. It says persevere not to just enjoy the ride. Yes, it's going to be a little bit harder. But the, the reward is going to be worth it. Yeah, come on. See here, guys, the challenge is once we start to consecrate ourselves, make ourselves holy for 2020, once we start owning up to our sin, I want you to take it the next step as well. Make your sin right. Mm -hmm. Don't just talk about it and let it just go, okay, grace. Right your wrongs. If you lied to somebody, own up to that. Go, go apologize to them. If you did something in darkness and, and hurt one of your relationships and haven't actually went out and resolved that, go and resolve that. If we're going to make our New Year's resolution, we have to get rid of old reservations. See, we are not going to be perfect in conclusion. Joshua, all of Israel was not perfect, but they were called to consecrate themselves, make themselves holy. In the same way, guys, we're not perfect, but we are being made perfect by God. James 1.4 says, let us and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Meaning that God is going to work through us in each of our lives to, to complete us in his perfection. Mm -hmm. Let God's work of repentance be complete in your life. Mm -hmm. Guys, the story of one sin 
Yes, we probably have sinned already this morning walking into this church. Already had a bad thought, already done something stupid. I understand that. But the main thing, guys, is, is really opening up to those deep things in our lives. Don't allow that same darkness to come into this new year. Allow this to be a new year, and let's go consecrate ourselves.